Hello and welcome to TICT's Export Ready Marketing Masterclass. My name's Karen Fraser. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I have approximately 35 years in the tourism industry. I have worked in the area of inbound marketing. Uh, I moved to Tasmania to work with Tasmania's Temptations Holidays, which was the government wholesaler, and I worked for Tourism Tasmania as International Marketing Manager for approximately 14 years. I've also lived extensively in Europe and North America. So with a great deal of experience and years, I'm hoping I can bring you some information about export marketing the benefits of it, how to be involved, and the way forward. It may seem a bit odd talking about international visitors in this climate that we're in with COVID-19, but just as it's important to have a, a reaction and a first base strategy going forward with the intrastate market and then the domestic market when it opens up, it's equally as important to plan for the future. There will be pent up desire to travel to Australia and Tasmania moving forward. It may be a year away, it may be two years ago away for the longer haul markets, but it is really important to be knowledgeable of what you need to do to prepare for it. Okay, so why inbound tourism and what are the benefits to us in the Tasmanian tourism industry? Inbound helps to counterbalance the number of Australians that actually leave to travel internationally. So um, Australia is a, traditionally a country where people do go overseas many times during the year long haul and short haul. So um, it's important to be able to bring uh, a balance into the destination. It's not as focused on weekends or our Australian public holidays, so people tend to uh, travel at various times throughout the years and that evens out our pressure of seasonality during the peak and the troughs that we experience with school holidays and public holidays. It's also about spreading risks across various markets and looking importantly at this time and looking at the opportunities as they arise. Inbound visitation to Australia and indeed Tasmania has increased over the last eight to 10 years, although 2019 has seen a, a slight decline from the international market into Tasmania. One of the benefits of focusing on inbound visitors is because they are high yield visitors. They spend more money per visitor generally than the domestic market. The lead in times to work with the international market are longer, therefore you have the ability to plan um, for a longer period of time. And then that gives you the ability to um, look at where the various sectors and that you're working in can fit in your planning scheme. You meet people from various cultures that adds more colour and depth to your own experience in life. And I think one of the great benefits is you get the opportunity as a tourism operator to share the benefits of Tasmania with your international guests. They're seeing our wonderful island through new eyes. We may be used to it, but Tasmania has a huge reputation that is desirable amongst um, other markets. You get the opportunity to make lifelong friends because working with the international trade and inbound tour operators is is a big commitment and people are fairly stable in this um, industry so there's benefits in making great colleagues and friends over a period of time. Importantly inbound business is big business for Australia. Its export is worth 36 million dollars which makes it the second largest industry in the country. 
The value of the inbound visitor to Tasmania for the year ending December 2019 was quite significant even though there had been a decline in the actual visitor numbers and the visitor nights that they stayed. Total visitors to Tasmania for last year was 1.35 million, an increase of 3%. Interstate saw 1.15 million come to the destination and international visitors unfortunately was down 8% but still we had 282,900 visitors arrive. Importantly, Tasmania receives about 3 to 4% of all visitors to Australia and whilst the visitor numbers declined, average spend per visitor was up by 10% and the spend per night was up 17%, which is quite an exceptional increase. In terms of the markets that are coming to Tasmania, we saw 42,700 visitors from China, from the USA, which makes up about 15% of our international markets. There are about 44,000 international visitor, uh, USA visitors. Hong Kong makes up about 10% of the market at 28,000. UK, we see about 27,000, which is in that bracket of around 10%. And New Zealand, which could be a very important market for us going forward in the immediate future, were about 20,200 visitors. So, and then the remaining came from a number of destinations such as Singapore, Malaysia, um, Indonesia, and of course the European countries such as Germany and Switzerland, France, Italy, and to a lesser extent, Scandinavia. How do the visitors travel? How do you travel overseas? You know, do you go as a, on a group trip? Do you travel as what we call a fully independent traveller? Or do you partially package and do something that you've booked in advance and then free will the rest of the time? So for the international market, again, they travel similarly. So you have the group inclusive tour where all travel, accommodation, transportation are all pre-packaged and purchased in advance. Then, as I mentioned before, the fully independent or fit as it's commonly referred to in the industry, make their own arrangements. They possibly purchase um, part of their package um, via a traditional means such as a travel agent or an online travel agent and an airfare in advance. Partially packaged again, you'll see them purchased air and maybe one or two nights in the city that they arrive into. Looking at visiting friends and, and relatives, the VFR market, typically spend at least part of their time staying with friends or relatives, and they may travel with them to see other parts of the destination. They may use an agent to book their, their flights, obviously, but also part of the package that they're going to encounter. And then they, if they're here for education, they may be staying for a lot longer, but generally their length of stay in the destination is much more than the typical um, round, round the island visitor, of, which is about 10 nights. The backpacker market is an increasing lucrative market for the destination. Whilst they don't spend a great deal on accommodation, they may not be staying in five-star luxury, they will, however, stay longer in a destination and they tend to engage in more experiences within the destination. So the value of that tourist gets shared more around the industry. Business travel is, or is a lucrative market. Whilst it's pre-packaged in terms of the reason for them coming to the destination, whether it be for a conference, a sales trip, um, or meetings, they then 
can extend longer to enjoy more of what that destination has to offer. They may only stay an extra couple of nights, but they can also be good return um, visitors. The education traveller is um, one that will also come for a special um, reason. It may be to do a short course or a longer course. They can be uni students, but they also can be travelling as an alumni group. So a group of like-minded uh, visitors that will do maybe a special interest course um, or involve themselves in another sector as well as tourism. The other sector is special interest and that's similar say to the education travellers. So they come here for a specific reason. They may be wildlife enthusiasts, they may be birders, they may be what the UK call puffer nutters, which are people that are interested in steam trains. There'll be various reasons as to why they come to a destination, but again, it's another segment that could be of benefit to your product if it fits well. Cruise is an interesting segment, particularly following on from what we've been experiencing. However, it is an opportunity to leverage the ability to sell your product within a structured format. So planning is a key benefit with the cruise market. Learning to work with the shore excursion operators and offering product and promoting it to the type of people that are on board, the type of ship is really key and we can cover that off further along in um, learning about the international visitor. Okay, so researching and understanding the international visitor is key. There are a great deal of benefits to the international market as we saw earlier, but there are also challenges. Travellers may have little knowledge of the destination, so part of the role is education. There are higher marketing costs to reach the international markets. You need to be aware of the, the requirements of each market and segment. The itineraries tend to be complex. There's language and cultural differences to take into consideration. And you need to be aware that it's a long-term um, investment before you will recoup some of those costs. It may, may take several years to see a return on investment. In considering with, the, with working with the international market, it's really important to consider your product or product offerings and to take into account whether you believe your product is strong enough to stand alone and attract visitors and get the interest of the trade and the industry or whether you think it would be more beneficial to work with a group of operators and bundle your product into developing a larger experience. In many ways this is more attractive to the travel trade because it's less work that they need to do. So the things that you should consider is product tailoring. Really know who your market is and the segment that you're attracting. Are you working currently in the domestic market? And what are the type of people that are experiencing your product currently? Really know your unique selling points and what it is about those that will appeal to the market that you're targeting. Have you got feedback from operators and from guests? You should review that. Consider your product pricing. Consider the pricing that your market that you're targeting will be prepared to pay. And will that allow you to work within the network and be able to pay the sufficient commission levels that are required? Where's your location? Are you within easy reach of a a main city where, a pe where people are likely to arrive into or do you need to work with a transport operator to get them to your attraction? Where is your attraction and what is it? These are the things that you really need to consider. What are your hours of operation? How long is the experience that you're providing? 
have information easily available for your clients. Reservations, how are you taking bookings? All of these things need to be considered well in advance. So, I want to um, read something to you from somebody, from an operator who's working in the international markets and has done so for some time. This is a quote from Timothy Cran Cranfield of the Great Southern Touring Route. Tim says, the Great Southern Touring Route enables four regions within Victoria to work together collaboratively, combining their resources to pitch their destination to the world. Looking for partnership opportunities, especially in region, can provide your business with a voice and increased exposure. So it is really worth considering whether sh you should bundle your product. So, is your product right for the international markets? Is it are you already working with the domestic market? Can you stand alone or should you fit within a wider itinerary? Should you bundle with nearby operators, complementary product? What about itinerary planning? Have you looked at where your clients are coming from prior to arriving to you and where they're going to? How will visitors reach and purchase your product or experience? How do you take bookings? Let's talk about distribution channels. So in about the early 80s, it was fairly simple. We had the traditional distribution method. So as a supplier, you would talk to an ITO, short for inbound tour operator, who would then talk to a wholesaler and the wholesaler would then distribute the product or the experience to the retailer or the retail travel agent who would then talk directly to the customer. So let's go and look at who those intermediaries are. So ITOs, for those of you who have not had experience in this market yet, an inbound tour operator is a middleman. They're the person, they're generally based in Australia, primarily in Sydney or Melbourne, and they are the conduit between you, the operator, and the wholesaler, and ultimately the retail travel agent. They are consumers of product experiences, hotels, um, transportation, attractions, etc. So it's really important to build relationships with these people and also to be aware of the required commission structure. So the inbound operator is the conduit to the wholesaler. You've paid them 25 to 30% commission and the wholesaler, for example, maybe someone you know, like Hello World, who work in the international market as well. So they will have a, a brochure or online brochure of product and experiences that they will distribute to the retail travel agent. And the retail travel agent is the main person that the consumer speaks to. So like in, in High Street and one of the main streets in any town in Australia, there could be a retail travel agent in there. And, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Smith go in there to book their overseas holiday. So the retail travel agent will show them a selection of brochures from which they can choose experiences, hotels, transportation, etc. Or they may come as a bundled up package as we've spoken about before in the GIT sector. So if you look to the other side of the screen and you can see the new distribution channels, not so new, they've been around for quite some time now. However, it's a bit more of a maze. So there you are sitting up there as a tourism operator in the supplier box and there's your customer at the very bottom with a number of intermediaries between you and them. Through your website, you can still reach your customer directly. That's a given. However, you may also choose to work with the channel manager, which are a new tool that allow you to manage your pricing as well as your calendar 
um, to enable, enable you to work more closely with the other distributors. So some of the channel managers you may be aware of or are working with could be the likes of Sightminder, Little Hotelier, Front Desk, there are many. Okay, so the channel managers can work through the this, this switch, which is back of house inventory, through to the global distribution systems, which takes the product down to the traditional wholesaler or inbound tour operator, and then down to the travel agent or the travel management company. So a travel manager company or DMC is just another term for an inbound operator. And then to the consumer. So it's a complex maze, but it's basically giving you a platform for broader distribution of your product. So just to give you some examples of the players that are out there that you may have heard of, um, We'll look at the inbound tour operators. So for the US market, there are some strong players that are carrying Tasmanian product. Goway, ATS Pacific, The Taylor, and Swains are some. From the UK market, you've probably heard of Trail Finders, Turquoise Tours, or Taylor Made. And then from the China market, China Travel Services, Japan, you've probably heard of um, Kintetsu, JTB, just to name some. And so each market has a particular inbound operator that they work with in Australia and a whole, who then work with the wholesalers that have a range of retail travel agents or online travel agents that support the sale of your product. Okay, now we're going to deal into the subject of yield management, but there are a couple of things that we need to look at first. We need to consider the pricing of your product and the things to consider for success you need to take into account are what are the fixed costs and overheads that you have? There are a few things that we need to consider when looking at pricing and getting your key price right. They are your fixed costs and overheads, your competitors' pricing, and the level that the target market is prepared to pay for a similar experience, the cost of distribution of your product and the various commission levels that need to be built into the overall price, any ongoing variations in seasonality, and what is the bottom line that you really need to make to be successful. So once you consider all of those components, that will give you your key target price. So in yield management, you need, it's the science of looking at that key target price and what you need to pay out. So looking at yield management, which is about seeing how you can get the best possible results from the way that you distribute your product. Let's look at this chart. So say you have 40 tours in a season to sell at $100. Then your net revenue is $4,000 and there's no commission paid. If you're working with an inbound tour operator and you sell 10 tours, to that inbound operator where you've paid them. Now we're going to take a look at yield management, but before we do, and let's have a look at this chart, and I'll go into detail on the chart later, but just to point out to you the commercial realities of paying commission, and remember you've already packaged the commission into your price, let's look at how it works across the board. So. Retail travel agents receive a 10% commission, domestic retail travel agents. Wholesalers, if you're dealing with either domestic or international wholesalers direct, you will be paying 20% commission. And if you're working with inbound operators, it will be somewhere between 25 and 30% commission. So in this instance, 
let's have a quick little scenario where we have 40 tours to sell over the course of a season. If you're lucky enough, you think you can sell 40 tours directly on your website or through walk-ins without the support of the industry, you have 40 tours at $100. So that will net you $4,000 revenue and nil commission. If you're distributing your product and you think that you'll sell 30 tours to the retail travel agents at $90, because they get their 10% commission, your net revenue will be $2,700 and the commission paid $300. Working with wholesalers, whether domestic or international, you'll be paying 20% commission to them, which is $400. And if you sell 20 tours at $80, your net revenue is $1,600. Working with inbound, which as we said before, receive between 25 and 30% commission, and you're selling them 10 tours at $70, your net revenue is $700, and the commission that you've paid is $300. So as a total, your net revenue is $10,000, with a commission paid of $1,000. That's just one example. Okay, a second example. Now this example is where your product is being distributed further across the board. So of your 100 tours to sell, 20 of them go direct at $100, the nil commission and a net revenue of $2,000. 20 tours go to a retail agent at $90. So there's $1,800 in your pocket and $200 commission paid. 30 tours at $80 gives you $2,400 in your pocket and $600 commission paid out. If you sell 30 tours to inbound at $70, your net revenue will be $2,109 commission paid to them. So therefore, you have a total of $8,300 revenue or $1,700 commission paid. So your average commission across the board in this example is 20.5%. There are many, many variables that are possible with the way you distribute your product. One of the challenges is planning for them. And again, this is something that we can cover off in more detail in the workbook that you receive. Commercial realities. Let's go back and have a look at them again because commission is very much part of the industry and you can afford to pay it because you've done the homework and you've considered all of the um, requirements that you have to arrive at your key price point. So, commission levels succinctly. Retail travel agents, 10%. Online travel agents can be anywhere between 15 to 20%. It will be interesting, I know, because some have rates of 12%, so a little bit lower than what we're saying there. Wholesalers, around 20%. Inbound operators and shore excursion companies, 25 to 30%. And importantly, in working with this industry, the contracting period is not from calendar year to calendar year. So the contracting period is from the 1st of April to the 31st of March every year. Bear in mind that the industry also works two to three years in advance. So working with an inbound operator, looking into the future that today, they would be looking at contract rates for 2021, 20, 22, and even 22 to 23. So that is something really to, 
to bear in mind in working with the industry. Let's just go back a little bit and spend a little bit of time talking about channel managers. So, we mentioned that they are an important tool to make your life easier in the long run. Okay, so channel managers act as the go-between for accommodation and tour providers and distributors. So they provide that tool where your pricing, your rates and your calendar are located. So you don't have to worry about overbookings. Channel managers manage your in inventory via multiple distributors for a relatively low fee. So the pricing uh, can be around $40 a month or a percentage of commissions. That decision on which travel manager you would use is very key and it's something that I think operators really need to consider and analyse as to which is going to provide the best value for them. Is it providing a flat fee or is it providing a small commission level? It really is up to the individual to work, work out. They provide, as I mentioned, the, the behind the scenes tool to manage inventory and third party websites. They allow real-time inventory to be available across multiple distribution channels and if a booking is made, availability is in adjusted. So it is very key to your business and they're some of the examples that we've already spoken about. The slide I'm going to go to next is a bit frightening to look at. So what a maze. Some of those names you'll be very familiar with and there are ultimate new players, but there's also been a lot of amalgamation between companies. So there's been a, number, a lot of integration within the distribution channels. Expedia are owners now of What If, they have um, hotels online and a number of other of the uh, companies mentioned on this slide. So there's been integration and again, it's something that you should be aware of and each of the channel managers have a different way of operating and different levels of commission that they may charge, depending upon whether the client uses the service of their virtual or their own credit card. So we're just going to look a bit deeper into yield management and this is a very complex topic. So succinctly, it is the practice of implementing a variable price strategy that anticipates and understands consumer behaviour during the different time periods in order to maximise the revenue of a perishable resource. So it's how to manage your product, how to make the best of pricing and some of the ways of working with the industry. So your yield management is linked to your trade distribution strategy. That is, how much of your product you aim to sell through agents versus how much you want to sell directly to customers should relate to the volume and the profit targets. Some of the do's and don'ts of pricing to remember. You need to get the price right for the market and compare it with your competitor's price. Build a totally consistent rate schedule. Guarantee your rates for at least the period 1 April to 31 March Price guarantees may be need to be valid through for 18 months, dependent on the industry partner you're working with. Ensure that your price will generate sufficient profitability and turnover. Ensure that the validity date and all booking conditions, including your cancellation policy, are clearly stated on all correspondence related to pricing. Ensure that you identify any seasonality in your product, i.e. high, low, seasons and days of operation, and clearly identify the corresponding rate 
alterations. Importantly, some of the don'ts are don't distribute rates intended for wholesalers and inbounders to retail travel agents. This will either increase your commission payment to the retail travel agent or dispense with one level of the distribution chain for your product. Consider commissions. Don't consider commissions as a discount as they are part of the cost of doing business. Intermediaries your partners have to promote your product and pay their costs in selling and packaging your product. That's what your commission contributes to. Don't try to set different rates for locals and overseas visitors unless there is a variation in the product offering. Don't offer the same thing for the same price to the people who walk in your door versus those that book through your inbound tour operator or your international wholesaler. Loyalty and ethics are an integral part of the inbound travel industry, particularly for new products and services in the international market. To maintain rate integrity and, void, and avoid indiscriminate distribution of rates, it's important that suppliers of new products and services understand the commissions and distribution channels. That's why I've banged on about it for quite a bit. You must factor all commission levels into your pricing. It sounds complicated and it can be. The important thing is to practice the varying um, distribution models that you're working with. Do some homework, consider all aspects of it network and talk to other operators, people with more experience, contact Tourism Tasmania, talk to ATEC, talk to the regional tourism authorities and ultimately it's working out what works best for your business and what gets results for you. Okay, let's go on to a little bit of a lighter subject. Let's consider all the aspects about working with the travel trade and promoting your product and experience. Things to consider when working with the travel trade include your brochure, what you communicate to your consumer and also to the industry. Do you need one brochure or do you need a couple of brochures? Maybe in language, that's a consideration. Do you know your elevator pitch? You should be able to stop anyone in the street and tell them about your product and experience in five minutes or less. What are your unique selling points? What differentiates you from a competitor or a complementary product? Do you have a website? And what is the information that is available on your website? Have you listed your product with Tourism Tasmania so that it's on the Australian Tourism Database Warehouse? Are you active in social media? Do you have a Facebook page, an Instagram site? Do you update it regularly? Have you worked with the traditional media with visiting journalist programs or news or other media such as TV crews, interviews. Have you a one-page trade summary of your product that you can easily distribute to potential partners? Do you have an image library of images with, with clients, customers captured, featuring people from your target markets? Do you have videos that you can provide to trade? Do you have reviews and accolades and awards, for example, state tourism awards, national tourism awards? You need to provide this sort of information to your potential trade partners. And then on top of that, if you're dealing with non-English speaking markets, providing translations. So there is a lot to think about. Other things to consider when working with the trade. 
large and small operators. It's not a one-size-fits-all industry. It's about finding what's going to best suit your business. Consider local operators. Within Tasmania, we have a number of experienced companies that are already working in the international market. For example, Premier Travel Tasmania is a pseudo inbound operator, but they work primarily with the uh, Western Hemisphere markets and the European market in particular. So they're a contact that you should make locally to introduce your product to them. There are other companies, Tasmanian Vacations Holidays, a domestic wholesaler may be looking at moving into the international markets as times move forward through COVID-19 and other Tasmanian operators that package up individual experiences to make a complete tour. Also, you should make best friends with Tourism Tasmania, your regional tourism associations and information centres, as they are all part of helping assist you get your product to market. Think about participating in Tourism Tasmania's Influencer Program, where they bring bloggers, Instagrammers to the destination to compile stories that you could feature in. Participate in activities such as TAS Talk and, Tasmanian, and the Tasmanian Roadshows and in-market visits. Talk to Tourism Tasmania, make sure they're aware that you are interested in working in the international market and then you will have the opportunity to participate in these activities. Make sure you consider working directly with the inbound tour operators, the Tassie specialists and the retail travel agents. Consider offering these people for meals that will suit their timetables. If they're coming to the state for a get-together with Tourism Tasmania, perhaps offer them ad an additional accommodation at your property or within your region. Also remember that this is an opportunity to bundle your product, to work with complementary operators and nearby attractions within the location that can be best presented to this member of the industry making their life easier and exciting by discovering more about the destination. In this time where things are a little slow and we're not really sure of the way forward and we're feeling our way, it's a perfect time to, to develop online material and educational assets that you can distribute to the industry. Perhaps consider a webinar a virtual tour, a virtual experience of your product and promote it in a way that is interesting and exciting and you can take the time to, to perfect it and develop it for distribution within the industry. These are really important things to remember when you're working with the trade. You're working with people. So look, be authentic and honest about what you're offering. Don't over-promise and under-deliver. Experience is the key, but it's always really good to tell the story as it is. Don't make grand ambit claims. Focus on what you do and what is special about your experience. And also, importantly, remember that you're part of a large destination of product that's being promoted. Know the story behind your experience. Consider how it links in with the broader Tasmania brand and story. And importantly, make sure that you align with Tasmania's brand and messaging. Continuing along working with the trade, more important considerations. I said right at the beginning that this industry is about building relationships. So consider, go back, consider who and why that you need to build relationships with. Consider what memberships you have and what you may require. So think about the Tourism Industry Council of Tasmania, 
your regional tourism organisation and your local tourism association, as well as ATEC, which is the Australian Tourism Export Council. It's an industry-based membership organisation that lobbies government and works collectively to assist tourism operators to market their product internationally. Also, Tourism TAS and local accommodation and tour operators and other organisations. It's easier to work collectively than individually, but it's important to keep in the loop and network. Again, can't say it enough, your friends, your neighbours, your family should know your elevator pitch and you should be able to deliver it ad infinitum on call. Offer as many presentations as you possibly can. Practice delivering presentations and offer to do presentations within Tourism Tasmania, the local tourism visitor information network and your regional tourism organisation. The more presentations you do on your product, the better you will become. Seek feedback, really important. It helps you tweak things that you may not consider important and it's a way of providing self-improvement along the way. The most important thing to consider I think in this industry and, and building relationships is also to build a football team around you. Whilst you promote your neighbours and complementary product, they will promote you. It makes life a lot easier if you work as a team and work together after all, that's what we do in the tourism industry. One last thing that I would like to mention to you is what I consider your most invaluable resource. And it's located on the Tourism Australia website, which is www.tourism.australia.com.au. And it is the Tourism Export Marketing Toolkit. It has so much valuable information for you online and it's free. Well, that's it. Thank you everyone. I hope you've enjoyed this masterclass and importantly, I hope you've learnt something and I hope you are ready and interested to go forward and market your product, your experience internationally.